you bring a Bible? Good. Let's talk scripture this morning, shall we? Did you come hungry? I know you are. Every Sunday morning, there's not a Sunday goes by that everybody walks in that door, they're not ravenously hungry. And now that we've been socially quarantined and haven't been able to come to church much, they're hungrier now than they've ever been. But your good shepherd, the Lord Jesus himself, is faithful to see to it that you're fed his word. That's what he's going to do today. Take a Bible and let's pray. Father, thank you for the written word. Thank you, sir, for this promise that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're going to act like it's so, because it is. We can depend on it and depend on you to do what you said. You said that what you have promised, you are able also to perform. And since we believe that, it is imputed unto us for righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As I said last night, I, I dreamed that I was preparing to preach in my high school economics class, home economics. You know, why would they call it economics if you're not talking about finances? Why would they call it home economics and not teach you? Did they, did they teach you how to balance a checkbook in home economics class? I don't remember. Where does economics begin? It starts at home, don't it? You better have some economic sense about you in your home. Because you have to live there. Isn't there a scripture where Jesus said, why would you have a man come and take away thy bed from under thee? <laughs> I dreamed that I was standing up. In my high school economics class, there was a, uh, when you walked in the door at the other end where the teacher's desk was, in the back, in that far corner, <clears throat> and it was at the end of the hallway. When you went into Old Westwood High School and went past the set of steps and went up to the right, you went around in the, 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 the uh, principal's office and all the office, administrative offices were right there in front. And you went down a hallway but under the steps past that, that. And down the last end to the right was where the home economics class was. And I was there last night. I hadn't thought about that class since the last time I was in there. 1975, four, five. And there I was. And they set a pulpit up in front of me, and the door was over in that corner, and people were beginning to come in. And, and I began to open up a scripture and told them, y'all turn to Acts 10, verse 38. So let's all turn to Acts 10 and verse 38. And in Acts 10, 38, when in, the, in the dream, <laughs> it didn't read like that. It didn't read Acts 10, 38. And so... As I look for Acts 10, 38, the people began to be distracted. Some left the room. Others began looking at their phones. Others, a few started smoking. <laughs> and I said, y'all, it's, it's, it's Acts 2, 38. What I meant was Acts, it's Acts 2, 38. But that wasn't right either. And when I couldn't find the scripture, I just said, look, y'all, prosperity should be taught as a home economics class. And then I woke up. I've never preached a home economics class. So here goes. <clears throat> Acts 10.38. You back up into verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That means Lord of the Jew, Lord of the Gentile, Lord of the church of God, Lord of people that are walking in his light, Lord over people that are walking in darkness. He is Lord over all. That word I say, you know. Say it. I know the word, Pastor. 
The word which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now here's the 38th verse. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Now let's see what he did. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Then he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. You know what good, the word good means? It means prosperity. We call it goods and services, don't we? When something is good, it is prosperous. It's good. Jesus went about right then doing good. Now let me show you how this is first on his list. Look at, um, look at Luke chapter 4. In the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, And everybody listening and watching and attentive said amen. Amen. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Now, why, why did he come to Nazareth? He went home, didn't he? Home economics. It was Mother's Day. Went home seeing Mama. You're right. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go back and look at that. Do you want me to read that now? Go back and look at Luke chapter 3. Now, when all the people, verse 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved son. In thee I am well pleased. Now that was a supernatural experience, wasn't it? And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Matthat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Janna, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Mattathias, which was the son of Amos, which was the son of Nahum, which was the son of Ezli, which was the son of Nagi, which was the son of Maath, which was the son of Mattathias, which was the son of Simei, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joanna, which was the son of Resa, which was the son of Zerubbabel, which was the son of Salathiel, which was the son of Neri, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Adai, which was the son of Kosam, which was the son of Elmodim, which was the son of Ur, which was the son of Jose, which was the son of Eliezer, which was the son of Joram, which was the son of Matthat, which was the son of Levi which was the son of Simeon, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Jonan, which was the son of Eliakim, which was the son of Melea, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz, which was the son of Salmon, 
which was the son of Naasson, which was the son of Amminadab, which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Ezram, which was the son of Pharaz, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Terah, which was the son of Nacor, which was the son of Sarak, which was the son of Ragal, which was the son of Phalek, which was the son of Heber, which was the son of Selah, which was the son of Cainan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sim, which was the son of Noah, which was the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Meliliel, which was the son of Cainan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Sounds to me like God Almighty is interested in genealogical reporting. God gave birth to Adam, who gave birth to Seth, who gave birth to Enos. We could go all the way back down to Joseph, who was there to be the surrogate father of the Son of God, who was born of a woman who gave birth physically to Jesus Christ. It's interesting that God would have us read this on Mother's Day. I think. Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And it comes down to verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, gospel means good news. Now, what would be the good news if the poor heard it? This poor thing is over with. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. He sent me to recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. He sent me, he said, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. And gave it to the minister. And he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Yeah, he is. We just read it being the son of Joseph, and then we read all the genealogical reporting up to the son of God. Yeah, he is. And he said unto them, you'll surely say to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever we've heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent except unto Sarepta, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereon the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, 
and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Now, Pastor, what's this got to do with the home economics class? I'll tell you this. When you're teaching home ec, that prosperity as a home economics subject, and you're teaching it among your own people, you're often not heard. Oh, I've been called it all. Church on the money, money grubber. I got some watching right now call me that. I do. But see, you're in your own hometown hearing a hometown boy talk about things that you're not willing to receive. I can say add this to what Jesus said and not add to the scripture at all. There are many people right now struggling with their bills and can't pay things, but only to one is he willing to go to, the one that is willing to listen to the word of the Lord when it comes out of the mouth of the hometown prophet. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, throw your stones. I'd still rather be me than you. You want to hear home economics as a subject matter? Let me show you this. Acts 2.38. When I was looking in my dream for Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He went about doing good, doing good, doing good, doing good. Do Why would they want to throw him headlong off a cliff? He's doing good. Why do you want to hurt him while he's doing good? I don't know. Why do they want to get rid of our president while he's doing good? Because it's not about doing good. It's about who gets to be in control. I'm talking about in spiritual things. Acts 2.38, when I went there in, the, in my dream, and it didn't read like Acts 10.38, it still says, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a gift. What did you have to do with your salvation? Did you, were you able to dance a tune and, and uh, walk on your hands and do cartwheels and do great works and give to the poor and give to the ministry and earn your right? I was talking to Lance last night. He was talking about somebody said to him about how he'd gotten way over budget trying to build a house. And finally he said, well, you know, I think what I'll do, I, 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 maybe I can get it built and have all the church over. And maybe we can get some things done uh, spiritually. Basically, is what he was saying. What he's trying to do is con God into paying the bills on the over-budget house. <laughs> There's a reason for prosperity. And you'd be surprised what it is. Let me ask you this. Have you ever prayed you'd win a lottery? Yes. Have you ever prayed thusly? Father, if thou wilt allow me to win a lottery... I will give to the ministry. I will buy a new church. I will tithe. On, will you pray, did you ever pray all that? I'm going to show you in a minute why God wants to prosper you, and it ain't to build a church. And it's not to give to good works. Now, would you build a church with it? Probably. Would you uh, give to good works if you were have a gr great, uh, you know, windfall of profit? You probably would, but that's not the reason God would give it to you. And the sooner you get your mind renewed to it, the freer you'll be. Can I leave you on a cliffhanger and make you wonder what God wants to give you great wealth for? Hold on right there, and we'll be right back after this commercial message. No, listen to me. Listen. I'm just going to leave you hanging there for a minute because God Almighty wants to bless you beyond your wildest imagination. But you got to see his mindset and not try to build your own. Quit trying to outthink him. Quit trying to con him into doing something for you by telling him what you'll do if he does something. <laughs> he got you saved when you weren't looking for him. What did you have to do with your healing? What did you do to earn it? Wasn't it the grace of God that healed you? Yes. Marie Phillips, wasn't it the grace of God that healed you? 
Now, let me ask you this. What do you think you'll have to do with your divine prosperity? Amen. Will it be a grant or something that you had to work feverishly for? I believe in working a job. I do. I believe in being diligent. I do. But I also believe that you don't need to limit your income to just your job. Amen. God's got a hundred ways to get you a hundred dollar bill in the next five minutes. Amen. He's got a million ways to get you a million dollars and do, could do it this year. He does. He can get anything over to you. He is God Almighty. What, let's quit selling him short. Amen. He can do anything Amen. and wants to. Amen. But what does it take to receive from him? It takes faith in him, not me, not ourselves not our bargaining chip. Listen, he overthrew the tables of the money changers where they would, you know, go and buy their little uh, bargaining chips and go do their slot machines. That was in the temple. This is called home economics, prosperity as a class. Where did I leave you? He said, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, let me show you a little trick here. Considering home economics, turn to Acts 16. <laughs> this is that story where Paul and Silas were in jail and they were been beaten and their feet put in the stocks. And they began to sing and praise God at night. And while they were singing praises to God in verse 25, the prisoners heard them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself because, boy, they'd... They, they didn't tolerate a jail man, a, a, a prison guard or a prison warden that let anybody out. They tortured him and killed him. He'd have killed himself supposing the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm. We're all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And brought, he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And look what he said. Dance on your hands and offer to God that you'll get, build him a church if you win a lottery. <laughs> he said, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And this home economics class on prosperity. This is a, a salvation that belongs to the whole house. Everybody. Everybody gets in. I saw, I saw a movie years ago called... Tucker, the man in his dream, about Preston Tucker that developed that car right after second, the Second World War, and it had a, it was innovative ideas where it had a fuel injection for the first time. It had four-wheel disc brakes and had a center Cyclops headlight that turned with the steering wheel so that it wouldn't be unsafe to drive. It didn't have dark spots and didn't have, didn't have blind spots in it. It had a padded dash and it had seat belts. Nobody ever had that. And all it was changing an innovative way to change the whole way that we drove vehicles. And Ford and General Motors and what was to become Chrysler all got together. And uh, Henry J. Kaiser was one of the ones that was back of it. And and the folks that made the Packard automobile all crushed in together to stop him from doing it because it would have cost them. Well, because somebody else had a better idea. And they stopped him. He built 51 of the cars before they forced him into bankruptcy. But now all of our vehicles we drive today have the same innovative things that he introduced in 1948, including fuel injection, seat belts, four-wheel disc brake, all those things. Cars are much safer than they were back then because of that one man. Now, here's what he thought. I said, oh, let's just tell you this. He had a bunch of people over at his house one day and family members and friends were all over one day at his house in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And his housekeeper came in and said, dinner's ready. How many? He said, uh, everybody. <laughs> they said, Preston Tucker did not exclude anyone. He just believed that it, he was no respecter of persons. He was a wealthy man himself. But if some Yard worker showed up, feed him too. Everybody, say it, everybody. 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 
That's a prosperous mindset. Remember what he said? You'll prosper and be in health as your soul prospers where nobody's excluded and everybody is included. Amen. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and, and everybody. <laughs> everybody gets saved. Everybody gets this. Everybody gets in on this. He excludes no one. I preached a message about this and I had a guy, I didn't realize it, that was here just visited that one service that really, really believed in exclusivity. That this gospel was for the elite few. People that deserved it. And of course he was one that did. And I preached a message on whosoever believes, whosoever the word, whosoever comes out of Jesus' mouth, out of Paul's mouth, especially Jesus. And he dubbed me Pastor Whosoever. That's my name. And he hadn't been back. Good. Keep your exclusive self elsewhere. But this still, this gospel's for you too. You know, it's funny how the, the, the blood of Jesus will cleanse the man that, that drove the spike and sprayed blood all over him. That very blood that he created by driving the spike in the man's foot cleansed him of driving the spike in his foot. Isn't that amazing? Everybody. Say it. Everybody. Everybody. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your house. You'll be delivered. That word saved means delivered. Delivered completely. How, how delivered, Pastor? spiritually, mentally, physically, in your relationships and in your finances, totally made whole and stay there until Jesus returns. That is called deliverance completely for the whole man, everybody. Now, it says here, and he took him the same hour that night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, notice what he did. This jailer brought these prisoners into his house and set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with, say it. All his house. All his house. Everybody. Everybody got saved. <coughs> I liked what that evangelist said one time. I was at a church and uh, remember Cecil Tompkins? Y'all, who, who in here remembers Cecil Tompkins? Pastor of Riverview Temple of Faith. And I uh, served with him for 18 months. He trained me. And I was taking a course at his church for 18 months years ago. And uh, um, there was an evangelist who came in, told him one day, he said, Pastor, Pastor Tompkins, I was down here at this tent. Man, everybody was there. He said, really? I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> he said, man, they, everybody showed up. He said, I, I, I didn't. Did you, John? <laughs> everybody got saved. Everybody got saved. Hey, I believe in everybody, don't you? Everybody. everybody. In Luke chapter 4, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to preach this gospel to the poor. We talked about 3 John 2, where he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. My goodness. I was talking to Lance last night, and it struck me again how, you know, it's, there's an old saying that says you don't appreciate what you have until it's gone. That is so true in so many ways. Most people don't appreciate their excellent health until finally they hurt or finally they have to keep going back and forth to a doc doctors over something chronic. And you don't appreciate those years that you were pain free. But let me tell you something. Get thankful over your good health. This, this week, early in the week, I went to a local um, landscape company and I ordered 2,000 pounds of crab orchard shale. These rock that was, that's uh, mined out of a place in Rockwood, Tennessee. And I bought 2,000 pounds, put it in the back of my truck. They did with a forklift. And I offloaded it all and started making a walkway. And when I didn't have enough, I went and got another 2,000 pounds mm -hmm. and came back and offloaded it and made more of the rock walkway. And when I didn't have enough, I went back the third time and got another 2,000 pounds. Got what was left, brought it back, and finished out my walkway. And when I got done, I had about 6,000 pounds of rock laid out for a walkway. You need to come see it. It's really neat. I hung two porch swings under two limbs in this 135-year-old tree that's in my backyard, climbed the ladder, put the anchors in the, in the limbs, and did some lighting. Huh? As I was cringing. As she was cringing. But... When I got done, and then we went to Nana's yesterday, and Greg Burge and I went 
over here to a place at Quick Creek and got two truckloads of beach sand and shoveled it out onto the beach area at Nana's Lake and got that all spread out. Then we began to run a log splitter and pick up big pieces of log because the two trees had fallen in the yard and, and uh, the, it was a family effort cutting up all the trees. I mean, there must have been six, eight cords of wood cut up and we were running that splitter and I sat down last night with Lance in my backyard on those new swings. I was telling him after what, what I had done. He came to look at it and, we, and I said, Lance, it just struck me again. I've moved 6,000 pounds of rock this week, offloaded with shovels, sand, in the, in, and ran a, a log splitter, and I don't hurt anywhere. My back doesn't hurt. Harold Lewis, my back don't hurt, brother. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It don't. My knees don't hurt. My elbows don't hurt. My shoulders don't hurt. I have full range of motion. And I'm 61 years old. That's got to be prosperity. Amen. It has to be. You can't call it anything else. It's wonderful. And I don't take it for granted, but you know what? It ain't earned. So it must be granted. It must be a gift. Healing is a gift. Amen. Prosperity is a gift. Good health is a gift. Mental peace is a gift. Deliverance is a gift. He said, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach this good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the prison doors to them that are bound, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and comfort all that are mourning, to, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. He'll swap your ashes for beauty. The oil of joy for mourning. You quit crying. You start being bubbling joyful all the time. And the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He'll take that weight of heaviness and depression off you and give you praise and blessing and thanksgiving over for, and swapping for it. He is the most uneven exchange agent I've ever known in my life. Yes, amen. I mean, that's even a more of an uneven exchange than Jim Fergosi for Nolan Ryan, which that's, that don't mean nothing to you, but it means something to me. Just something that helps me. <laughs> He'll give you these things. If you look to him as a giver and not somebody you got to pay all the time for your gift, quit economically trying to deal with him at home I'll do this if you'll do this, like you're going to buy him or con him. Just relax and let him just give it to you. He's got it. He can afford it. Amen. And he wants to give it to you. Remember I told you that I'll show you the reason why God wants to prosper you and it's not what you think it is. Remember I left you hanging. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. The Old Testament was written for our learning. These, these things were written aforetime were written for our learning so that we through patience, patience, in other words, wait. I think, is Rusty Dunn still watching? Rusty Dunn, are you watching? You and I talked about this one day, brother. I taught a message called weight training, W-A-I-T. He said to me back then, he said, you know, he said, Pastor, that did me more good than anything I've heard in some time. He said, I need to learn how to wait. Call wait. Wait on him. What, doesn't the scripture tell you to wait on the Lord? Wait, I say on the Lord. Wait on him. Depend on him. Be patient. Wait on him. Wait on him. He'll do something. Watch. Wait. Wait on him. It may not happen quick, but you wait. and stay. See, there's something about waiting that exercises your patience, your consistency, and let patience have its perfect work so that it, in, in time you'll be perfect and entire and in want of nothing. I can't think of a thing I want. I don't, I'm not in want of anything. I'm not in need of anything. I don't want anything. If I want it, honey, I don't want it five minutes. He just goes giving it, giving it to me. <laughs> Go ahead and say amen, Pastor John. He does. He, if I want it, just a few minutes. Now let me show you something right here. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Y'all read with me. Watch this. This is when Israel 
had come out of Egypt and gone into uh, the promised land. He said, they're preparing for the promised land. Verse 1, he says, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe and do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And you shall remember all the way the Lord which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Who, who in here has lived for the last 40 years? Do you remember your last 40? Okay, look here. In the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his word or not. And he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you knew not. You didn't know where your sustenance was coming from. You didn't even know where this manna came from. Neither did your fathers know where they came from. That he might know, make you know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. And your raiment, your clothing waxed not old upon you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. Thou shalt also consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastens, chastened you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. And the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. Good. There's that good again. There it is. The Lord your God brings you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and depths, and that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness, and you shall not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. See, we live better than this. I had never dug a piece of brass out of a hill. Have you? No, I go, to, I, go to, I go to Home Depot and get my spun brass, doorknobs and door hinges and you know, cabinet knobs and uh, brass containers. If I want brass, I get that already spun and bought from the store. I don't even have to dig in the hill. But he's telling you that this is a land that has commodities in the ground, and that's what he's going to give to you. When you have eaten and are full. Who in here has ever eaten too much? It's because you're full. It's called being full. When you have eaten and are full, then... You shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he's given you. Sounds to me like you pray after you eat, not before. Then you bless the Lord your God. I think if we forgot to pray, let's go ahead. Let's just thank him for our full belly. Hallelujah. Okay. Beware that you forget not the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day. Lest when you have eaten and are full. Now this is going to happen while you're full, while your gut is full. And when you have built goodly houses, underline houses. Harold Lynn just bought a second house. Second one. More than one, y'all. Everybody go. Do like this, go. Two. Two. When you built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and ter terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and, and drought and bill collectors and debt collectors and tax men and all those kinds of things that are scorpions. And he's describing things that people deal with when they're lacking and hurting and in need. And you need tires on your car and you need, you, and the plumbing goes 
goes out at your house and then the power gets cut off and all those and back when you went through all that stuff and then you didn't even have a house living. You had to go move in with kin folks and all that stuff. He said, we led you through that terrible wilderness. There have been people that lived through these terrible wildernesses like this and they got blessed and prosperous and then they forgot that they went through all that stuff because their heart got lifted up while their gut was full where there was no water because your water got cut off. Who brought you forth water out of the rock of Flint? He found some way to get you something to drink. Who fed you in that wilderness with manna where you still, even in the worst time of your life, still did not miss a meal. Which your fathers knew not that he might humble you, that he might prove you to do you good. There's that word good again. At your latter end. Who in here can tell me that this is the latest you've ever lived? <laughs> well, you're at the latter end, at least for today. Like the guy said, you live here all your life? He said, well, not yet. <laughs> he said, to prove you good at your latter end, and you say in your heart, you didn't even say this out your mouth, but he knows your thoughts. You say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this well. I'm the one that got up at 4.30 in the morning. I'm the one that got out before daylight. I'm the one that showed up on the job. I'm the one that built this business. I'm the one that did all this. I'm the one that worked 15 hours a day. I'm the one. If it wasn't for me, a bunch of people wouldn't even have a job. I am the one. People go, oh, that pride goes to speaking to you. My might and the power of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Don't say that in your heart. He said, Verse 18, but you'll remember it is the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth, 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 say it, giveth. giveth. Does that sound like a grant? Yes. Is he that gives you the power to get wealth, power to get wealth. You, got the, you did the getting of the wealth. But he's the one that gave you the good back that could bend over and pick up 6,000 pounds of rock. He's the one that gave you the ability for your hands to work and to know how to get things done. He's the one that told you, taught you how to roof that house. He's the one that taught you how to build that foundation. He's the one that taught you. He's the one that showed you. He's the one that gave you the ability. He's the one that did it. He's the one that made the phone ring when your business was under. You, you, listen, I know you know how to do your work, but he, the phone don't have to ring. He's the one that made it ring. Okay? It is he that gives you the power to get wealth so that you'll have enough money to build churches and preach the gospel all over the world. Is that it? No, he gives you the power to get wealth for this sole purpose only that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. What did he swear to my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Didn't we read that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were in the lineage of Jesus, which was the son of, which was the son of, which was the son of? Didn't we read that? Yes, he promised Abraham that there would, he would bless him and his seed after him for eternal generations. And Abraham said, I don't even want the shoestrings off. I don't want anything. I don't want anything. All I, lest anybody say that any man made Abraham rich, but I lift my hand to the God of heaven, for it is he that, that gave, made Abraham rich. Let nobody say anybody did it but him. Now, he'll do this for you just so he can fulfill his promise to his covenant friend, Abraham, when he said to him, I will make your seed as the stars of heaven for multitude. And he promised him a threefold triune blessing. Abraham received a triple blessing from God. It was a blessing of, of financial prosperity, physical prosperity, and a spiritual blessing. And we are the seed of Abraham. The Bible says that the law was given till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And that promise that was made to Abraham was for his eternal generations forever and all of his seed. And the Bible says that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. That's who you are. You are in Christ Jesus. That makes you the seed of Abraham. And the only reason he would give you Wealth. The only reason 
is because he promised it to Abraham. He promised it to your fathers. So I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the father of faith. And I expect him to pour blessing on me beyond any, any imagination. I want people, I, you know, I want, it, I want it said of me. Look at Mark 10, 29. Put that up on the board. You want me to tell you why most people, most Christians resist this message of prosperity? You want, you want to know why? Here's why. Tell us, Pastor. Hey, I got a new super giant print reference edition Bible. Brand new. Nice big lettering. Who would like to have a new super giant print reference edition Bible? Have we given them out so much now that y'all y'all loathe the big new Bible? You want one? Here, take that, take that to Emily. Run that to Miss Emily. She'll raise her hand. Run that. Run back there. I do not know how to do this, he said. There you go. I'm going to show you why people resist this message of prosperity. Because it comes with a price. There's a price you pay. It's a gift. But there's a price you pay. Look at Mark 10, 29. Does it start out by saying, for there is no man? There's no man having left houses, land, brethren, sisters, fathers, mothers, wife, children, or lands for my sake and the gospel. See, you have to leave the opinions of everybody around you and stay with the gospel. This doesn't mean leave and go to China. This means leave the consensus of everybody around you that says you're a money grubber and your church on the money and all that junk that you get accused of, you have to leave all of that and stay with the gospel. Amen. The gospel of prosperity and healing and blessing and wholeness. Amen. Stay with it. Stay with it. Because God has no pleasure in those that draw back because of the heat. Look here. But he shall receive a hundredfold. When? Now. Say now. now. How, how now is now? now? Notice how now always updates itself. As soon as you say now, then it, it moves up with you. Now. Look. Now. 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 In this time. In this time. In this time. Not when you go to heaven. In this time. Houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. There's the big word right there. The big P word. There it is. That's why people resist the subject because that persecution can get white hot. They'll talk ugly about you. They'll, just about the time you get somebody in church that really needs the, the healing power of God, Aunt Matilda and Uncle Bromley Shaw will come in there and tell you he's the church on the money and run them out. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And so they have to go back around the mountain and kids go through rehab again and people, get, people lose their children again. It ain't worth it. Stay with the gospel. Stay with the message. Stay with the prosperity. That's where your children keep their blessing. That's where your children walk in the Holy Ghost, the move of the Spirit. That's where your children rise up and call you blessed. That's why one like Philip that had four daughters which did prophesy. I'd like to have four kids. That, well, I do. <laughs> have four children that prophesy. And in the world to come, eternal life. Thank you for joining us for the Word Wise Christian broadcast here today from Church on the Word. Remember, God sent us His written Word to straighten out our thinking. When His mindset becomes our own peace, supernatural peace that passes all understanding is always the result. Our believing gets straightened out. Our mouth gets straightened out. Our confession, that's when our life gets straightened out because we've just become Word, word Wise. God bless you. See you next week. Yes, amen. Well, you're too late if you want to mouth off about prosperity to me. You're too late. Yeah, but you're just an extremist, Pastor John. Yeah, extremely blessed. Amen. Extremely debt-free. Extremely healed. 
Oh, Lance said something to me. My younger son said something to me last night. It broke my heart. He said, Dad, I, he said, I got, I got two of my best friends, two of my very good friends that buried their dads this year, both of them younger than you. How old were they, Lance? 55, 6, 58, two of them. He said, I'm sitting here, I still got my dad. It was a sobering moment for him when he went to those funerals, those boys whose dads died in their 50s. Unexpected. Quickly, quickly, both of them, within just weeks apart, wasn't it? One week apart. First thing you think is it could have just easily been you. No, it couldn't have either. It's hard to kill me. Uh-uh. Hey, if persecution could kill you, I'd have been dead a long time ago. I'd rather be me and persecuted and blessed than my detractor, unpersecuted and cursed. Pastor, are you a respecter of persons? I'm a respecter of faith and a respecter of the gospel and a respecter of the, the gospel message. I'm a respecter of the anointing. I'm a respecter of what good he wants to do you. I'm a respecter of the fact that he wants to give you beyond your wildest imagination. Troy, stand up, son. The word of the Lord just come to me for you. Everybody look at him. Everybody give, put your attention on him. You're soon to marry into my family. So I prophesy prosperity to you. Yes. Not one in my family walks in, in poverty and, and lack. Everybody in my family walks in prosperity and blessing. So supernatural prosperity beyond your paycheck, beyond your talents, beyond your abilities, beyond your knowledge, and beyond your training comes on you. Come on you from behind and overtake you. And everything that you set your hand to prospers. And you're going to find out knowledge of witty inventions. And you're going to be able to buy and sell and be in a marketplace in such a way that you had no idea that this was the kind of finances that would come to you. You'll build a house and build it strong and build it powerful and build it spacious. And then you'll get it paid off and then you'll build another one and you'll have that that one too. Then I prophesy to you a beach house and one in the mountains. I pro prophesy to you more vehicles than you can drive. I prophesy to you more children than you can possibly keep up with. That's why you got to have a smart wife that knows where they're at at all times. <laughs> I prophesy to you the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. I prophesy to you that you will prophesy like the wind. I prophesy to you that you all will, God Almighty will speak through you just like the oracles of God and people will stop, their mouths will stop and listen to what comes out of your mouth today. I speak prosperity to you in Jesus' name. I love it when the Spirit of God wants to prophesy to people. I love it. Yes, I love it. Yes, I love it. Yes, I love it. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Yes, amen, sister. Prosperous sister sitting there all prosperous like you got on the cowardly lines. Uh, I don't know what that thing is you're wearing, but it sure looks prosperous to me. <laughs> Let's bring the lights up in the house just a little bit. <coughs> Say it. All my children are taught of the Lord. All my children are taught of the Lord. Great is their peace and their undisturbed composure. Mm. Your son bought a house last week, didn't he? I'll lift our hands to him and thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the great and the blessing. <laughs> Amen. What will ye that he should do for you? No. Say, say it. As you have spoken in my ears, so will I do unto you. What will you that he should do for you? Okay, you'll just take a, 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 a print of that. All right, what I said to him, I say to you in Jesus' name. Okay? I say it to you. Yes. I'll take that too, except for the 
<laughs> Everything, including. Hey, listen, he's not a skin flint. He wants you blessed. We got to go, but I got to remind you of something. It was in the, uh, in 1974, I had been, and I never said much about this because it, it bothered me too much, even into my adult years. I was bullied a good bit in elementary school. That was, it seemed like a, some of it, now looking back on it, it was um, due to the calling on my life. I don't know what the devil knows about your future, but he knows something. And he, he sees patterns. And I saw it in other kids that are also gospel ministers today. I was bullied pretty, pretty regularly. And when my first year in high school, I was totally intimidated. Our, our high school years began in the eighth grade in Fulton County, so there was no middle school. One through seven was elementary, and the eighth grade started high school. And that first year, I was just uh, uh, really intimidated by everybody and everything. It's just, it was overwhelming. I just, you know, I was raised pretty sheltered and didn't get out much. And so this whole big new high school, I didn't even know that all the 200s classes were on the second floor and the 100s classes were on the bottom floor. It took me a, about a quarter to figure that out. And, uh, but there was a kid that was a, pretty much a bully and bullied everybody and shoved me around a good bit. And one day... A senior, one of the seniors, a guy, his last name was Roberson, reached over and put his arm around his little brother that was also an eighth grader and kissed him right there on his temple. Kissed him good, right in the hallway. Kissed him real good. And that big bully started mouthing at him, calling him something that had to do with inordinate affections. And when he heard him, he turned with his little brother in tow. He, hey, that's my brother. I can kiss him anytime I want to. In the mouth. And when he yelled at him, a victory swept over me. That the guy being persecuted spoke back, and he spoke with an anointing. And then he told him where he could kiss him <laughs> specifically. <laughs> And then another victory shot all over me, and I got tickled. There were four boys, all of them, last name Roberson. In that moment, I had a flashback feeling of when my brother was in Vietnam and my, sis my sister-in-law lived with us, brought home, I, I brought home this game called The Game of Life. I bought it from a Milton Bradley store, right? You remember The Game of Life? Yes. You know who invented that game? Art Linkletter. I play in the game of life with my sister-in-law, and you have a little car, and you go in here, and then you get married, and then you have a child. And I mean, you're a blue peg, and she's a pink peg. And then I wound up, and you have a child, and so I put another blue peg in, and then you have another child, and put another blue peg in. Then I didn't have room for pegs. Then I had another blue peg child. I thought, where do you put it? So we looked at the we looked on, on the instruction. It said, "If you run out of slots for your children, just crowd them around like in real life." So I remember putting that peg in there, and so I had this feeling over me of having boys. It was a good feeling. I hadn't thought about that feeling until that day, that that boy had to young his little brother and kissed him and mouthed off at that detractor. And I thought, God, I want boys like that. And when I said, I want boys like that, that feeling of when I was playing the game of life in 1971 with my sister-in-law hit me, swept over me. Guess how many boys I have now? He heard me say, God, I want four boys like that. I got four boys. And I'll guarantee you that right there will kiss his little brother right on the temple. I bet you he will. What you bet? Go kiss your brother and tell everybody I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Those boys like to get together. What they used to haven't done it in a while. They used to get together and call it what they call a bro night, where the bros get together and play video games. Let's all lift our hands. Let's all lift our hands. All these things are free for the asking. Let it come out your mouth. 
Let your prosperity come out of your mouth. I speak debt freedom to everybody here. Not one dollar's worth of debt do you owe a man. You are free and paid for and it's all yours and there are no late fees and there's more than enough and you have no need of any outside aid or support but are fully functioning and fully furnished for every good work and charitable donation Amen. as the scripture says in Jesus name. Is that you Terry? Yes, sir. Amen. Let's all stand. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. To you, where's Allison? Allison, run up here, baby. I want you to take a rose to every one of the mothers in here. Take that one. Start right here with Mimi. Give this one to Miss Lynn. Uh-oh, take that one right there for Miss Lynn. Okay. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Here you go. Take that one. Here you go. Will, come on up. Run up. Are you glad you came to church this morning? All right, lift your hands. God bless y'all. The Lord bless and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, give you peace, and that all your children rise up and call every one of you moms blessed. Get to see them today. Go eat with them. Love on them. They're going to love on you. In fact, I think they're all going to give you some money too.